Welcome to the Voice of Salvation programming, whose main source is to be an inspiration to you through the message of hope and peace. And this is only achieved when you remain in tune. Stay with us and you will be blessed. The Bible tells us in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. John was continually proclaiming the supremacy of Christ over himself, but in terms of nature and work. The meaning here is that John cried out with a very loud voice, speaking out very openly that this Jesus was both before John in time, for he was from eternity, and that he was to be preferred before John, in that he was due greater honor. The translation from Greek to English is difficult, but our authorized King James Version is accurate in the sense it conveys. A literal translation shows both the meaning and the difficulty of finding an easy expression of the meaning. He that cometh behind me has become in front of me because he was before me. Jesus came after or behind John in that he came after John in his introduction to men. He was before John in two cents. He was first in terms of time, for he existed from eternity. And he was also first in terms of position or dignity. John's great insight into the person and work of Jesus is remarkably demonstrated here. He understood the doctrine of the pre-existence of Christ. This point needs emphasis because many Bible students underestimate the depth of John's spiritual knowledge and his work as teacher of the great truths concerning the Savior.
Christ the Word. The Bible tells us in the book of John, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now the three clauses in verse 1 contain all that is possible for us to realize regarding the essential nature of the Word in relation to time, mode of being, character, and His relation to God. He was in the beginning. He was with God. He was God. He was a distinct person in the Trinity. Here is one of the deepest and most profound of all truths in Christian theology. The nature of the union between the Father and the Son is beyond our mental capacity. There are many helpful illustrations, but all of them are inadequate. Let us know that the Father and the Son are two distinct persons in the Trinity, but yet they are one, inseparable, united, and undivided. The early Athanasian definition states it this way, We worship one God in three persons, united in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. The scriptures tell us this much, Let us believe the word of God and be content with what he has seen fit to reveal unto us. If we were to go back to the Gospel of John, we would see that the Word was made flesh. John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The main truth of verse 14 is that the Son of God took human nature upon Himself, so that he might redeem us from sin. He was truly man, and yet at the same time he was God as well as man. The union of the two natures, the divine and the human, in one person is of the greatest mysteries in Christian doctrine. But here it is clearly taught in these verses. He was very God and very man at the same time, but the divine and the human natures in him were never confounded. One nature did not obliterate the other. Each of the two natures were ever perfect and distinct. The humanity of Christ during his lifetime on earth was never unlike our own, except that he did not experience sin. The deity of Christ was never laid aside for a moment, though he was veiled at times. Though he became flesh in the fullest sense when he was born of the Virgin Mary, he never ceased to be at the same time, the eternal word of God. To say that at any instance of his earthly ministry, he was not fully and entirely God is nothing less than heresy. This would strike at the very foundation of the doctrine of the incarnation. There have been more corrupt and heresies of this union of the two natures of Christ than any other doctrine ever taught. Yet this verse refutes them all when it is rightly interpreted. The Arians hold that Jesus was not truly God, that he was greater than man, greater than angels, but less than God. This verse refers to him as a person in the Trinity. The Apollinarians admit that he is God and man, but they say he took the body of a man, but his divinity took the place of man's soul. This verse teaches that flesh means he took on the whole human nature, spirit, soul, and and body. The Nestorians teach that he is both God and man, but they hold that the Godhead made one person, and the manhood made another person. Was made implies a union in which Christ took on, not the person of man, but the nature of man. The Eutychians held to the one person of Christ, but they confounded the two natures, saying that the Godhead and the manhood combined together to make the third thing which was neither very God nor very man. This verse refutes that theory by presenting the two natures unmixed. Now, as we go back to the Word, we see that the Word is also life. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 tells us the following, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. 
Verse 2 says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The Apostle John was about 90 years old at the time of this epistle, and these words reflect the same thought expressed in the opening verses of the Gospel of John. All the years of his experience had not altered his understanding of who Jesus was. John in verse 2 is recalling those wonderful days of fellowship he had with the Son of God while on earth. It is now some 60 years since the ascension of Jesus. He speaks of Jesus as being from the beginning and refers to him as the word of life. He records the ways he had observed the Son of God and that twice he says that they had heard him. Twice he related that they had seen him. And once he mentions that they had looked upon him and once that they had handled him. Now, John continues to tell us in 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Verse 11 says, And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And verse 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. My friends, a part of the Trinity is that it gives us eternal life. It is clear that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three distinct persons, yet these three are one. The reference to the Spirit, the water, the blood, seems to be a witness on earth to the deity of Christ. There is no higher witness that can be found than that of the Spirit of Truth. The water and the blood refers to the two fundamental and essential elements in the life of Jesus as Savior. The water points to the purity of His human life, dedicated to the will of the Father and symbolized in His baptism by John. Now the blood points to His suffering and His crucifixion. John is here stressing both the humanity and the deity of Christ. Some of the false teachers of the day were teaching that divine nature came upon Jesus at his baptism by John the Baptist, and that it departed when Jesus was arrested on the night of his betrayal. But John refutes this heresy. You see, the deity of Christ rests not on the witness of man alone, but on the witness of God. The believer has within him the perfect assurance that the divine witness of the Father is true. He is completely satisfied that Jesus is the Word made flesh. If one doubts the testimony of God, he makes God a liar. The record may be understood as the witness, and thus we see the continuance of the thought. John sums up the witness, giving both the negative and the positive aspects of God's gift to men of eternal life, which is to be found only in His Son. To have the Son is to have life. To not have the Son is to not have life. The book of Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through 13 say the following, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. What we are witnessing here in these scriptures is a triumph in power and glory. 
You see, John's vision of the Son of God in glory is an appropriate conclusion to what we're talking about today. What one believes about the person of Christ is of ultimate importance. It is useless to sing songs about him, talk about the miracles he performed, discuss how good he was as a person or how wonderful were his teachings, and yet deny his complete divinity as the eternal Son of God. The Trinity is not to be interpreted like so many stair steps which place the Holy Ghost on the bottom step, Christ on the second step, and the Father on the highest step. They are all equally one. There can be no separation or division in the nature of the Godhead. Without the Holy Ghost, one cannot be saved. Without the Father, one cannot be saved. Without the Son, one cannot be saved. Jesus made this inseparability clear when he stated that he and the Father were one. John stated concerning Christ, and the Word was God. To honor God is to honor the person of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I pray our message today has been a blessing to your life.